I'm very pleased to be here for a host of reasons, including that this is a important next phase of a step that uh, Jim Laird with his team has taken around 2015 already. And then you can see how long sometimes it takes before you come from an idea to the lab, to the pilot, to really factory scale. And this is where we're at. And that is fantastic because very soon you can all uh, start buying these ingredients, using them and helping actually to take a micro protein, uh, including all the partners to the next level. What is the purpose of this webinar? Actually, first is inform, uh, second is to inspire, and third is to network. The idea is actually, and this is why Shannon put in the bottom part of this um, uh, slide, please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, the idea is that new networks are also going to be for formed during this live webinar. And uh, that very much would like to, uh, everybody I think will appreciate that. And it's also necessary because these current partners are great and they can really bring it to the next level, but a lot more help and support and inspiration is needed from others. Yeah, so um, my uh, question to you, Shannon, is maybe on the first part, we've got three great people, Louisa first, um, and, and then Martijn and Jim, but here's the full program. So, um, uh, I'll say a few more words maybe about the introduction. We start with a fantastic presentation by Louisa Massia, project um, uh, officer at CBE, uh, the organization that has en enabled this project to really kickstart with funding and also other support, support in managing it as well as support in promotion. And that's fantastic. The second presentation is by Jim Laird, C CEO of Enough. And he will really maybe look back seven years and also uh, a year, half a year or three years ahead, because his focus is very much to get things going, uh, but not forget about the big picture. The research outlook is done by Martijn Becker, who is with Wagen University. And then we are going to have a Q&A with a panel uh, of uh, also project partners who are all eager to work with you and also in this project. Uh, from different perspectives. Alexander Lam is with the company called IFF. Most of you know this company as a great ingredient company globally. Uh, Bastien Besser is with Lactips, a, a company based in France, also active in um, using um, ingredients for non-food applications. Peter Verstraten is um, the CEO uh, of COO, he should explain that later, of Mozameet, but he's been there uh, for for many years uh, in building a company. And then Sonia uh, Pignatelli is, uh, has done a lot of work already on life cycle engineering, explaining actually, okay, when you do this project, what is then the benefit for society in terms of uh, um, uh, LCE uh, or uh, life cycle analysis? Then we've got a QA and a and uh, later on we're closing as well. Have a lot of fun be inspired and do network because that's what we can do to actually make the world a little bit smaller. Louisa, may I ask you to come forward? Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Louisa uh, Masha, uh, representing the Circular Biobase Europe uh, Joint Undertaking, uh, in short, uh, CBEJU. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, just said, I'm the PO of, uh, of Plenitude, and I'm very happy about it. As uh, I've just said to the uh, project partners, it's a topic of, in which I'm interested professionally and also uh, personally. So really glad to be here and really happy to be able to share with you today a few words on uh, who we are, uh, what we do, and in particular, uh, how we are contributed to a greener and more sustainable future, hopefully. So, uh, CBJU, for those who have not heard about it before, it's a public-private partnership between the European Commission and the Biobase Industry Consortium, also called BIC, uh, both uh, respectively representing the public and the private uh, partner. It's uh, a seven years and two billion euros uh, initiative which operates under Horizon Europe which you probably know is the new uh, EU framework uh, for research uh, and innovation. CBJU entered into force recently, uh, three months ago, 
uh, but we are not new because we are building on the successes of our predecessor, which was called Biobased Europe, uh, Biobased Industry Joint Undertaking, and which was part of uh, Horizon 2020. And in fact, in my presentation, at some point, I will be switching to BBI and JU. Uh, because we just ended the uh, program uh, just at the end of 2021. So most of the impacts and the numbers are related still to BBIJU, while CBJU has not yet launched uh, its first programming and its first uh, uh, course. So in terms of uh, organizational structure, we have a governing board where both parties uh, are represented equally, an executive director and a program office where I, um, of which I'm also part. And we also have two advisory body, one composed of member states uh, and associated country representatives, and the other one is a scientific committee with uh, uh, 15 uh, scientific independent uh, experts. Our objectives are threefold. First and foremost, uh, accelerate the uh, development of biobased innovative solutions. And once the solutions are mature enough, speed up their market deployment. And all of this while uh, ensuring a high level of environmental performance of the system and of the uh, sectors. But um, just want to make a, a step backwards of why, in the first place, uh, this kind of partnership was needed for the biobased industry sector. And uh, here's the concept. So there's a, a biomass out there which is attractive and convenient feedstock, and we should be transformed and processed in uh, biorefineries, in flagship biorefineries, and transform ultimately in biobased products. So you see the challenge we had a decade ago, uh, the, the bridging the innovation, to the innovation gap and the deployment gap, as I said before. So to ensure that the research knowledge on the one uh, end of the bridge could be translated into bio-based product, uh, uh, products uh, at the other end of the bridge. And I'm showing you with some picture how those seven past years uh, went by. So first of all, BBIGU was heavily involved in transforming a sector which was very fragmented. Uh, we helped to de-risk uh, investment and reinforce innovation and uh, uh, actually extend infrastructure across uh, the economy as the picture, picture shows different sectors, very diverse materials, fuel, chemicals, uh, uh, farmers. Uh, so uh, we helped in this regard. Second step was to really mobilize and interconnect those actors and try to bring and reach the critical mass that the sector uh, needed. And third, uh, build new value chains across the sectors and realize this uh, uh, bio-based economy, this connected bio-based economy from the field to the uh, end consumers. Um, in numbers, this were, these were the pictures, and in numbers, seven years on, this translated in uh, uh, 822 million of BBIJU funds, which covered 142 projects, um, reaching out to more than 1,000 beneficiaries and spreading across 39 countries. Uh, uh, in the middle, you can see um, how the funding was distributed. Most of it went to private companies uh, with a small chunk uh, to uh, going to small and medium sized enterprises, which was a big uh, uh, win uh, and victory for uh, BBIJU. And also with a good 30% going to university and research center. The type of actions BBIJU has been funding, and this will be the same for CBJU, are research and innovation actions, uh, which have a TRL, a technology readiness level, rather low from three to five, and then innovation actions covering both demonstration and flagship, and which uh, you can see from the bottom of the slides absorb the majority of the uh, pot of the funding. And then we have a fourth type of action, which is not linked to a TRL, which is called coordination and support, uh, supporting action, and which uh, is more cross-cutting, so it covers more cross-cutting uh, topics. 
this shows a little bit how the uh, flagship by refineries in green and the demonstration plants in orange are spread across Europe. Um, and uh, in particular here, uh, focusing on the flagship projects, uh, um, you can see that most of them are located in Western Europe, but still we have three in the, uh, Estonia, Latvia and Romania in the east and one up north in uh, uh, Norway. 14 uh, flagships in total. Um, also, uh, the mobilization of the sector is increasing. In fact, we started from 39 proposals back in 2014 and reached 229 in 2020. And from the red dots on the map, you can see that the spread across the continent is quite uh, uh, even. This also uh, holds true for the diversification of the sectors. We, we've been seeing a growing diversification of the sector, which was already diverse uh, in the first place, but uh, these uh, are continued over uh, the years with packaging, food and chemical industry um, being on the front line, but we cover many sectors, including chemicals, bioplastic, textile, pharmaceuticals, uh, biofuels, electronics, and we expect uh, uh, more to come in the future uh, as well. Um, I would also like to say a few words on how we uh, contributed concretely to some of the EU Green Deal uh, priorities. Um, for instance, when it comes to the commitment to replace 25% of oil-based chemicals by, 20, by 2030, sorry, so moving from uh, EU uh, fossil-based to a bio-based uh, economy, uh, by our project, already by the end of 2020, there were 22 new uh, bio-based building blocks and 24 new bio-based materials. When I say bio-based materials, I uh, talk about fibers, uh, organic fertilizer, resins, just to name a few. And those numbers are expected to grow drastically in the next couple of years, uh, reaching 128 for the building blocks and 232 for the uh, materials. Um, second uh, commitment, reducing uh, uh, the EU dependency on the import of uh, uh, strategic raw materials such as protein. I will not say anything about this. We have a living example uh, today. So we'll hear that uh, uh, after my presentation by the Plenitude uh, uh, Partners. Uh, also, promoting a green recovery, so boosting green jobs by uh, 2030. Uh, more than half of our projects are creating jobs in rural areas. In particular, our 11 flagships uh, are, uh, have pledged to create uh, more than 3,000 direct jobs, mostly in rural areas, up to 10,000 indirect uh, uh, jobs. And fourth and lastly, uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. 50% uh, um, of our ongoing project will reduce energy consumptions, while 58% uh, will deliver bio-based alternatives to fossil-based products, uh, so lowering the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And also interesting to know, the 14 flagship uh, by refineries funded by BDIJU has pledged to save up to 720 kilotons of CO2. So as you can see, we hold the good cards, but we're not there yet. Uh, so we're talking about initiatives which are still, which are highly technological and which still uh, are, are risky in terms of investment and issues remain to access the private capital. The structuring of the sector that I mentioned before is still ongoing uh, and will continue uh, to go on and is not completed. Of course, some areas are not covered enough. We talked about the geographical coverage, but also in terms of stakeholders. So more involvement of certain participants, including farmers and integrating them in the value chains. Um, also, uh, whilst we've been um, really popping up in the last decade, a lot of, uh, e of national bioeconomy strategies, national action plans, we still need to uh, make the uh, regulatory and policy framework more robust and more uh, uh, coherent. 
And finally, continuing consumer awareness uh, uh, to be sure that the bio-based products will be taken up, that uh, there is a market for those products. And so this will also depend on how we tell the story of the bioeconomy and of the uh, bio-based uh, uh, products. Finally, as I said at the beginning, um, whilst BBIJU uh, ended its program in, uh, uh, had its last call uh, in 2021, um, CBJU has just been established, so we're still putting in place a number of milestones which are needed before launching the first programming and the first calls, but I can already anticipate that the first calls will be published and launched in quarter two, between quarter two and quarter three of 2022. So stay tuned and we'll uh, uh, share more information with you soon. And uh, uh, that's it. I hope I stayed in the uh, time allocated. Happy to see the questions in the chat and answer later. And uh, thank you again. Well, um, maybe some people are thinking of questions or raising their hands. Uh, Luisa, I think uh, I really appreciated uh, your story also with the large uh, slides about where we're not there yet, right? And, and then you mentioned uh, the agricultural part, the connection. Huh? And also the policy part, which is really also part of the big, I think, stakeholder plan. Um, what have you learned from the past project period right, with BBI and then moving forward uh, for science type of project or really business projects in this case uh, to, um, to collaborate on uh, versus the regulatory part? Uh, so, uh, just in a couple of words, in fact, uh, as you've seen from the type of actions we uh, fund, um, mm -hmm. we mostly focus, well, we greatly focus on the technological initiatives, mm -hmm. and we have a small focus also on the uh, more cross-cutting uh, issues that I mentioned, and the coordination and support actions are the type of actions where, you know, we try to um, um, encourage this kind of dialogues, uh, including uh, talking about policy framework, what are the legislative barriers uh, and what uh, and how to overcome them. And also uh, what we're trying uh, to do, but th this, as I said before, it's really a minimum part of our uh, program. Uh, but we work a lot on this also by our advisory body. I said at the beginning we have a member states, uh, uh, mm -hmm. state representative groups, it's called. It's uh, uh, composed by member states representative, which are a little bit our um, ambassadors, let's say, mm -hmm. in the country. And that's also uh, thanks to them and to their work that, uh, as I said, the, the bioeconomy strategies and regulatory framework were uh, adapted a little bit over years, but we're still at the beginning, uh, I would say, mm -hmm. much to, mm -hmm. to be done. So we hope to, um, to boost this up with CB. I understand. And uh, the, the, the last part, which I think if I will be be, be Jim, CEO of Enough, right? Um, and uh, now getting acceptance for microprotein as an ingredient in, in this whole field. Like, uh, um, if I will be Jim, I would sometimes feel like Don Quixote. I, uh, I have so many windmills uh, to, to go to, and uh, and these mills, windmills are small, they're big, they're different colors, they're in the, in the, on a hill in a valley. And uh, is that something that you recognize with these type of projects? Uh, well, I think it's uh, I think it's a priority, as I said. Uh, you know, one of the uh, commitment and priorities also in the Green Deal, and mm -hmm. to which we are also committed. So it's up to you to convince uh, uh, even more that this is uh, mm -hmm. uh, working, and therefore changes are needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, Jim, I think that's a that's a very good um, summary and uh, maybe a bridge to you. Uh, I don't see any questions at the moment in the chat. There is more opportunities to ask them later, and you will get a link to the recordings as well as the presentation. So, could I ask everybody for a big applause for Louisa, and then introduce you to uh, the next speaker? You can all raise your hands. Yeah, I can see yellow hands at the bottom, which is important to get feedback and also. I think the purpose also of this pre presentation I'd like to mention is that if you are 
uh, looking at scaling things, or even when you are having a research questions, this CBI um, um, trajectory is a fantastic trajectory to be involved in uh, with, with research partners or with commercial partners. So uh, follow um, CBE and then you will uh, see more about them when they're coming up with new calls. Jim. Gerard, thank you very much. And uh, Louisa, thank you very much. I think Louisa's summary at the end of changes needed. I, I think it couldn't be a more precise uh, example of what's, what the CBE and flagship projects are all about. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will try and share my screen. I don't know if Shannon, you have it or not. Uh, I just had it, but I'll do it again. Uh, yeah, yep, well, yep, well, it, well, it was well. showing. Feel free to go again. Let me go again. Um, so good afternoon, all. My name is Jim Laird. Uh, I am the CEO of Enough. And Enough is a coordinator for one of the flagship pre projects, Project Plenitude. Um, and we are immensely grateful to Lise, Louisa and to Circular Biobased Europe JU for their support and also for outlining the aims of CBEJU, which we fully support and applaud. I start by thanking you, Gerard, and to Bridge to Food for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, in my title here, I very deliberately refer to the market for protein rather than just microprotein because the aims of plenitude address the food protein market and the need for sustainable protein in its very much in its widest definition. And to introduce you to plenitude, it's uh, it, it was the 14th flagship project. As Louisa says, we are now to 18, and it's the 14th pro project awarded by CBEJU or its predecessor, BBIJU. And you'll, feel, you'll find details of this project on the website shown, and, uh, and I have a privilege to give you some more headlines today. Um, it is my pleasure to talk about how Plenitude addresses the future of protein, and I do it as one part and just a very small part of a very strong project consortium comprising 11 partners, all of whom I believe are instantly recognisable by their logos shown here. The Plenitude project was awarded in mid 2019 and it commenced in October 2019. And overall, it will run through five and a half years up until March 2024. And now, as with all of the all flagship projects, it includes a value chain approach and you see here the consortium partners. We have 11 partners across five EU member states and with a strong mix of large and small companies. And all parts of the value chain are covered within that consortium. Enough is the coordinator for the consortium and the goals of plenitude align very strongly with the purpose of enough, of enough which is to make protein more sustainable. Now amongst the 14 flagships shown on this page, uh, plenitude is special for many reasons. I think all flagships have uh, received very high levels of grant intervention, are multinational in their nature, and they're part of making the bioeconomy. Now, Plenitude is unique because it's the only flagship that addresses food, and this has become more of increasingly high profile and, and of global significance. I think COVID-19 has highlighted the pressures on global supply chains and further increased the profile of food security. So really, in a summary, Plenitude seeks to make high scale impact across the uh, dimensions of nutrition and of sustainability. And we address a market which is close to all of our hearts and which is both vast and continuing to grow very rapidly. The objectives of Plenitude are to create new bio based products and new bio based value chains. And we, we're making good progress in this with some of the uh, opportunities shown on this page. And I come on to talk about that. But in order to contextualize the future of protein, I'd like to start by looking at the protein market. The protein market is almost 600 million tons per year, and that's based on 8 billion of us consuming almost 75 or an, or an average of 75 kilograms of protein per capita on an individual basis. And if we believe much of the data from experts such as McKinsey, BCG, there is a very large gap in the solution to supply sustainable protein. The market is growing at a rate of about 45,000 tonnes every day, with two thirds of that coming from animal sources and one third from non-animal sources. And I think neither of these options is currently either truly sustainable or scalable. But we strongly believe, and I hope to come on and explain, that fermentation and mycoprotein are a key part of addressing that, the, this challenges problem. 
And the continuing scale of the market is highlighted by the fact that in the next decade, it will increase by almost 100 million tonnes as we get a bigger population and as we all turn to higher and higher consumptions of protein. And whilst intensive animal farming has in the past shown its ability to increase in scale, the challenges of animal farming are also widely acknowledged. So within the non-animal sector, the ability to increase by 50 million tonnes within a decade or 15,000 tonnes every day is currently a supply chain challenge or an unmet need. This chart, the chart shown here is from analysis from BCG and it shows how alternative protein, which currently accounts for only about 2% of the market, but it, but it shows a projection that by 2030, a little less than 3,000 days away, it will increase to by about fourfold to 8% of the market. This will increase by 52 million tonnes, an overall increase of 17% every year. And if we look specifically to fermented protein or microprotein, the growth rate at the decimated is much higher, growing at 75% per year, with a startling figure of an additional 4,000 tonnes of available new supply every day for the next 3,000 days. So we have the challenge, and looking at these numbers, it is challenging, I think it's important, but I think it's important to put in context the commitments that are made by our global leaders. As a company founded in Glasgow, Enough 3F Bio, we welcomed some of the commitments made in November of last year at COP26. Most notably, we applaud the pledge to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. I'd have to say it's a big task, uh, and it's only it will only be achieved by rethinking the future of protein. Both renewable energy and producing protein using animals are massive contributors to environmental emissions. And we're coincident coincidentally, they each account for roughly a third of, of methane emissions. Therefore, if we were to achieve this pledge, which has been committed to by world leaders, it would mean that either the full removal of emissions from energy or also or all of those from livestock. In 2019, renewable energy received $300 billion of investor funding. And with the investor funding in place and the commitment from governments to reduce the use of fossil fuels, the path for transforming energy emissions in that sector has started. I think the journey for changing our food system is still at a relatively earlier stage. The investment number in alternative protein in the same year was $3 billion rather than the $300 billion. But it's very apparent that even if governments are slow to act, the ESG, then ESG investors will fill this void. And I'd say if we do not achieve a protein transition, then regrettably the minus 30% pledge would remain, as Greta would say, simply blah, blah, blah. If you can accommodate me, I'll also I'll highlight some of the aims of Enough, uh, where we believe we can at least help to address unmet need. And we do so by building the world's largest new protein facility, new protein of any of any type and any any format. Enough's goal is to produce a million tons of sustainable protein by 2032, which is within 10 years of our first production plan for later this year. Uh, I think we get better get moving. Uh, and most importantly, we only do this if we can make delicious vegan foods that consumers love and that is both convenient and cost competitive. And we address this by growing protein that uses less resources than any other protein options. If we do this at scale, we'll address many of society's biggest priorities. And this is aligned with many of the UN's SDGs, notably addressing hunger, addressing climate change, and developing a more secure food system. Now, for the purposes of time, I'm only going to provide a super summarized explanation of the process of growing microprotein. But as some reference points, you'll be, you will be reassured that we are not alone in believing in the merits of fermentation. And I'm glad some of the people on this chart are on the call today. There's a growing number of companies in this space, and I presume that most of you are familiar with Quorn, who pioneered the fermentation sector, and also some very well funded others, such as Tomasek, Nature's Find, Perfect Day. Now, amongst these high profile peers, enough is relatively advanced. And we plan to be operational at scale later this year. Before talking about scale, which I enjoy, to explain briefly what we do, we convert any locally sourced fermentable sugar. We take it through a fermentation space and large scale fermentation to convert those sugars into whole biomass, which contains both fiber and protein. 
And this has applications in a very wide range of food formats. And we do this with a proprietary IP that creates a zero waste process. To look at the product, we uh, and its raw state, a bundle looks a little bit like uh, a bread dough, as you can see at the top hand, the top right of this page. It's pale in colour and it's got a consistency, a bit like a chicken mince or a bread dough. Now, its advantage relative to the full range of other protein sources in terms of sustainability and in its efficient use of land and water, and also low CO2 emissions. And nutritionally, it contains both protein and fibre, and importantly, all the amino acids and, and its versatility in product applications. In contrast to some of the names in the prior chart, enough do this on a B2B basis, supplying bulk in bulk as, as shown on the bottom right. Now, there are a whole range of potential market applications, and we address this with a full range of B2B partners, a fundamental belief in collaboration and with customers. And that includes the absolute strength from within this, courtium, within this consortium. And whilst we'll explore all potential applications, it's also true that the scale of demand in meat alternatives and seafood and fish alternatives alone would readily consume our initial capacity. But as part of the consortium, we absolutely enthuse about demonstrating the opportunity for bio-based solutions in some of these other markets further to the right. Many of the audience may be familiar with XPRIZE, where the current XPRIZE challenge is to produce whole muscle chicken or fish. And as, as one example of the merits of microprotein, we're pleased to have, been, to have been announced as one of the semi-finalists in this competition. If anyone has time later, there's a, a YouTube link to our XPRIZE application, which describes our plan to make a chi vegan chicken breast every second. Now that message of scale is something which within plenitude we will talk about repeatedly. And therefore I'd like to move on to our operational plans and our drive for scale. Within our operational plan, we're currently building what we understand to be the largest non-animal protein factory anywhere globally. Within five years, we expect to be producing a cow's worth of protein every two minutes, 30 cows equivalent per hour. Put it in context, this is more than the annual production from the entire Scottish beef industry. And we're building this in the south of the Netherlands, where we are co-locating a facility owned by Cargo, one of our consortium partners, that converts maize into fermentable sugar. By sitting on the Cargo facility in Sass van Ghent, we co-located between a starch plant at the south end of the plant and an ethanol bioethanol refinery in the middle of the plant. And by situating the middle, we enable our efficient zero waste process. In the picture you see here, we have utilities and nutrient preps down the left-hand side of the plant and a building which will accommodate roughly 20,000 tonnes of initial capacity and which has a footprint and a scale or in the land to scale to 60,000 tonnes. What you're seeing is a flyby. At this stage, we're making some very strong progress in construction activities and most of the tanks that you're seeing down the right hand side are, have been installed during the course of this month. I am tempted to leave that running. As in the interest of time, I'll move us forward. Try and move us forward um, and talk about the reason we do this. And the reason we do this is because it creates impact at scale. Most of the alternative protein options are advantaged relative to animal on a kilogram per kilogram basis. Now, the enough team are excited to progress this because by making food that consumers love and therefore thereby achieving the scale we will materially impact on a, on a massive market. For enough, the principle of scale is crucially important because only with scale we will make impact and the core impact is in terms of realising the aims of a sustainable protein transition. In metrics, reducing water use, reducing carbon emissions, supporting the switch away from animal protein, which aligns strongly with consumer trends and it's underpinned by creating high quality bio-based jobs. So I want to finish, or I want to revert to how this impacts on the future of protein. Microprotein is undoubtedly one of the main options to enable a sustainable transition to the future of protein. We do not crave a dystopian world where it's the sole choice, but we do see it as the most advantaged solution to meet, to meet the ever spiraling increase in demands. I have quoted BCG's estimate for the increase in market demand, and that equates to a suggestion that non-animal protein moves from 2%, around 2% of the market now, to closer to 10% by 2035. And this estimate is at the bottom end of predictions from 
wide range of experts, including McKinsey, A.T. Kearney, Barclays and more. The median estimate would be closer to double that prediction, around 20 percent, and the high end estimates are more in line with the view that the fate of animal farming may be closely linked to that of the combustion engine, with 40 percent of protein demand being non-animal based by 2035. If that was to happen, we may have enough soil to be scalable, but the supply of other pulses such as pea simply do not exist, and plant options would certainly face some limitations in scale. In contrast, if we were to replicate the $300 billion that was invested in renewable energy in 2019, we would readily provide food security with a non-animal option that, would, that could account for 30 to 40 percent of the market, as indicated here. Therefore, as a summary of the merits of microprotein to support the protein future, it's certainly scalable uh, using any locally grown feedstock. It's apl applicable in any geography. Um, it addresses food security by producing locally to the consumer need. It's more technology ready and it is more capital efficient than the most than almost all of the alternatives hy hypothesized. If I was true to myself at this stage, I would love to share you some food because I think nothing transforms a conversation like this than food, but in the absence of food, I simply share enough view of how we grow scale to address the protein market. We'll start with capacity in Europe, but we fully acknowledge the need to expand this into wider territories, and we will do this in collaboration, as is the only way we will achieve this big task. I thank you all for your time. Um, very pleased to address any questions, and again, I thank you, Bridge to Food, and to Gerard for uh, the opportunity to speak today. Many thanks, James. Shannon, do you want to say a word? Thank you very much for your much presentation, for... Jim, and we're open for um, questions now. I see a question, uh, Jim, from uh, Lara Tiro. She's from um, Canada, and she's asking about the nutrition and the labeling ingredient statement in nutritionals for Abanda. Hi, Lara. Um, great question. And um, Abunda Mike Protein has regulatory approvals in in about 37 markets now. It was originally in uh, in Europe under EFSA. Or, um, it's 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 Food Canada. I think came late to the party, but it, it was approved in food, in, in Canada several years back. Um, so it's back a pack declaration is Mike Protein small M. Um, I think there are more Mike Proteins coming, and I think with with that it will invite maybe uh, some clarification to ensure we give great consumer understanding. Um, in terms of nutrition, it supports a high in fiber and a high in protein claim. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question with the with the start line that is in back of packet, a small M micro protein. Um, mm -hmm. uh, mm, there are another two questions, uh, Jim. For, firstly, from Marcel van der Vaart. He's with Cosen Agriculture Company. You may know them. And, uh, and he's asking, are there currently enough initiatives Enough, enough initiatives in producing microprotein to reduce the future need projected. No, I think it's a great question, and uh, I have to regret that there's not. Um, I think we are not. I think we are with our big, hairy, audacious goal of a million tons within ten years. I think we account for around about two percent of what the market says is required. Um, and I see the protein brewery and others who are on this call, and I say. Let's, we all need to move faster because I think uh, collectively, if the predictions of the experts is correct, then we are not enough. And I don't think the industry is yet moving at the pace that can keep pace with that demand. Um, and certainly for enough point of view, we are blessed to be supported by some great investors. We will have that 10,000 tons in place this year mm -hmm. and we will start to invest for the second line before the first one is operational. But um you know, my, I guess, soundbite is enough is not enough. <laughs> That's a good summary. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a question here uh, also from Uwe. Uh, he's asking um, Uwe Richter. He's with the Gaia company. Can you um, make sure the media market is, how do you uh, um, ensure that the media market is growing aligned with the fermentation market in terms of the consumer adoption? That's probably the question consumer concerns and things like that. If uh, if that's not right, uh, Uwe, please correct me. But uh, what do you think, Jim? Um, so I, I guess the I think it's an interesting point that um, 
the top down views of the market is it's grown massively and is the bottom up aspect keeping pace. And I think we all know in our own markets, we see more products on shelf. We've seen good products on shelf and bad products on shelf. But um, mm -hmm. and it, when we we collectively have to avoid disappointing consumers um, because mm -hmm. we can turn them off. But I think if we make great tasting food, then we keep consumers happy. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the uh taste price convenience uh is the simple answer of if we've got taste price convenience we'll we'll do it right um <laughs> but let's not um upset consumers with I, th I think consumers have been disappointed over the years um they've not there's there's been a range of mediocre products out there uh mm -hmm. but well i didn't answer your question then please let's uh pick it up offline yeah. because uh I think I'll enjoy uh, the conversation go, all go, yeah go to the chat you'll see it's slightly different sorry uh, over but there is meanwhile another um, question from uh, Deb Anderson from the protein brewery huh? uh, asking about should should all micro protein companies label as such like nature's fine corn meaty etc all have different labeling on pack is there I think, a common I think the words we we need to be legal, legal, be safe, and inform consumers the best of our ability. Um, I think there is uh, a, enough and abunda use a similar strain as has been used and has been consumed within the product corn, and therefore has a mic has has used that back of pack nomenclature. Um, I think we we need to give consumers everything they need. I think our our. Uh, if we if we go for shorthand as marketing, then somewhere then it will cause consumers some concern. Um, so, in terms of the alternative, I see the question: nature's fine, meaty, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we are creating slightly different ingredients each, and I think we need to make sure that we collectively give the consumer enough back of pack information such that the regulator does not find it a problem. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, maybe the question is also when you look uh, in 15 years, when you look back, will then the consumers have uh, instead of soy or pea, the word microprotein in their mind after all the introductions and one overall word that could capture all the things that are, of course, with different strains and conditions. But I think I think it's not the best word. Um, I think we the people in this audience will, will agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think there's some examples in the US of uh, nutritional fungal protein. Uh, I don't think in Europe we would be allowed to say that, but I think it sounds it sounds more uh, food-like than microprotein. But um, again, we have to work within the constraints and uh, yeah. food constraints. Yeah. So so um, Am is a is a guest. Uh, to all of you in the audience, I would like to ask when you ask a question, uh, add the name of your company or organization, and maybe where you're from. It ma makes it easier. Anders got a question about uh, Abanda and high extrusion processing. Um, I love this question. Uh, I think legacy wise, uh, microprotein, which has a natural high, is naturally high in, fi high in fiber and therefore has natural texture, uh, did not turn itself towards high moisture extrusion, but we thought, why not? Um, and the answer is uh, high moisture extrusion can can do to microprotein what it does to mm -hmm. other protein sources, which is mm -hmm. to give firmer fiber formation. Um, not decrying high moisture extrusion, we the, the fundamentals of fermentation. It's a fairly simple process, a continuous process, low resource, low relatively low resources, and uh, I think we can. Maybe uh, we can. We, we we do not rely on high moisture extrusion to get that vitamin texture. There are some other processes which can achieve it. And again, working with likes of Wageningen, we are as part of the project. We'll we will look at the full range of opportunities there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. In view of time, I'd like to ask you um, th first to uh, clap again and sh and uh, ask, thank uh, Jim for sharing all his experience and know-how. Second is maybe Jim, if there's some questions in the chat. You could maybe answer them one on one or in the chat, and that doesn't stop. Uh, from um, actually the market in the future and the big things moving forward, you also need research. And Martijn Becker is um, very well placed. He's with Wageningen University uh, to uh, to show your picture on this crop or this actually ingredient, I should say, microprotein, as well as um, you know what you're doing, what you've done, etc. Could you come forward, please? Yes, um, I'll just put up my slides. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, 
There we go, Gerard. So I'll talk a little bit today about uh, uh, what we, what type of research we are currently conducting uh, on this uh, type of microprotein product, and uh, mainly also the outlook towards the future. Uh, there. And so as, as Jim very nicely explained, so this is a consortium of many, many parties. And uh, 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 the interesting thing is that uh, what is also clear from all these parties is that they all have different products. So that they will focus on different, different type of requirements for the final product. And that is, of course, very important. Eh? So uh, because if we if we just try to go a little bit back and, and look at the whole uh, 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 plant protein product development or potentially alternative protein product development, as Jim also indicated, in the past, there were quite a few challenges uh, in this field. Uh, so uh, uh, not everybody has been uh, developing always cost-effective products. Uh, this is uh, uh, already uh, improved at the moment. Uh, uh, a lot of off notes uh, and uh, taste defects were present in, in previous products that were sent to the market. And that usually resulted in uh, a masking, uh, so addition of masking ingredients, and therefore uh, uh, quite a few sometimes had to be added. And therefore, the, the label, uh, uh, the ingredient uh, listing became rather long, which was not always appealing to consumers. And not all the products had the type of nutrients uh, that should be in there. I think uh, an, a nice example is the shortage of vitamin B12 in some of these products. And uh, also, uh, there is, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, unclarity on uh, effective preservation of these type of products. And that, of course, results in, in a potentially limited or a non-shelf life that has to be further developed uh, for these type of products. And uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, all challenging and new. And that, in the whole, resulted in a rather uh, uh, complicated and time-consuming uh, new product development process. And I just want to uh, today give you a little bit of an overview on the um, the whole field as we see it and uh, uh, how this specific project fits in uh, 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 as we conducted at Wageningen research and uh, the type of technologies that we use to 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 meet these type of challenges. And so uh, as we see it, um, uh, there's uh, uh, three ways of using microorganisms for alternative protein. Huh? Uh, the first one is clearly the one uh, of the discussion today, that is using a, a whole microbial biomass. And that means that you cultivate microorganisms directly, uh, that, uh, as Jim also nicely indicated, that leads to a rather high yield uh, on the uh, uh, media. Uh, components, so you can produce it very efficiently, very uh, much continuously also, and so that uh, allows for a very efficient process. Alternative processes that are also used a lot in the market are the, the production of recombinant proteins, uh, and I think there's quite a few also nice examples of companies that do this. Uh, I think uh, the Perfect Day is one of the uh, 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 one of the examples that is there that try to make an alternative milk or dairy type product. Uh, by uh, producing, overproducing specific proteins, uh, in their case, uh, dairy type proteins, uh, uh, to uh, mimic the actual applications of the animal type product. And you can imagine uh, that this process uh, may result in very high quality products, of course. It is, however, a little bit less cost efficient, uh, obviously, as you produce these proteins in a specific reactor and not all the proteins and all the biomass uh, that is produced can be used directly for consumption, but only the specialty proteins. And a third one is, is classical fermentation. And that uh, really looks at uh, looking uh, uh, plant-based ingredients and converting these uh, uh, into foods and, and use fermentation for that. Huh? And so fermentation can be used to reduce specific off flavors, uh, sometimes uh, uh, change the amino acid composition of these type of products and uh, improve the overall digestibility of these products. Uh, and so at, at Wageningen Research, we focus on all these three topics, but the uh, uh, the current main topic of interest is, of course, the first one, the formation of microbial biomass, of which we also think this is a very interesting field and uh, very clear. So uh, uh, you uh, cultivate whole microorganisms directly for consumption. Um, and you can, uh, of course, use fractions or the whole biomass, uh, 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 both. Uh, so if you're either looking at the fiber-rich uh, uh, part or the protein-rich part, in general, 
uh, I think there's a, a lot of preference on using the whole biomass in the direct applications as much as possible. Uh, we think this has a very high potential due to a few reasons. Huh? So uh, uh, this, uh, we see this as an efficient way to upcycle specific residues, huh? as is also done in the ENOUGH process, where uh, 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 side streams are, so to say, used to upcycle uh, 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 the the, the uh, nature of these uh, uh, streams and ensure that you get a very high quality food grade product. This in general also uh, can have a very high protein content, uh, uh, far over 40% and even uh, uh, higher than that in some cases. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we are currently able to select uh, uh, organisms that have specific characteristics. Uh, so this may be a very good amino acid profile, maybe have a very good uh, texture for specific application to really uh, get that uh, uh, the characteristic in the final food uh, that you would like to have. And currently there's only a, a limited amount of microorganisms on the market uh, there. Uh, uh, and so we think there's much potential to, to widen this to a wide variety of applications. And that is why uh, we at Wageningen Research are so interested in this specific field. Um, I think what is important to realize huh, is that in this case, a specific uh, a fungal protein is used, but uh, uh, that the, the field is, is much wider than that. Uh, so uh, uh, at the moment, there's also a lot of uh, uh, yeast uh, uh, protein uh, produced. Uh, I think mainly Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but also quite a few other species there. And they are usually produced uh, uh, to gather a lot of yeast biomass or yeast extract, uh, as it is usually uh, called. And this results in a lot of microbial protein. And this is already done at a very large scale. So also shows that this type of processes can be run rather easily and very efficiently year to year, high quality uh, 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 to produce this type of food grade ingredients. Um, a lot of other similar processes um, uh, can also be used for specific applications. Uh, so there's uh, quite a few processes, and these are bacterial processes that are generally run to produce uh, specific vitamins like folic acid or vitamin B12 production, uh, but also those side streams, uh, so uh, biomass, microbial biomass is a side stream there that can be used for microbial protein. It can also be that you want to look at specific uh, 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 other type of products that are in the biomass. Huh? And so you could also focus on high fatty acid type of microorganisms. And so a high oil containing microorganisms like Kirovia lipolytica, that is a much more uh, high oil content and the protein could be a co-product there or side product, so to say. Uh, of course, you could also use the whole biomass here. Other types of processes, uh, uh, for example, produce a specific products that you might want to have. Uh, and I think a nice example there is from uh, Monilella pollinus that is uh, produced at a very large scale at the moment uh, or used for erythritol production. And you get a lot of biomass as a co-product there. Uh, so it can also be used. Uh, so all these type of examples show that, this, uh, that there's a lot of space to maneuver in this market and a lot of potential for using microbial biomass. And of course, uh, 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 I also still have a slide on uh, enough, of course, and uh, this was already very nicely introduced uh, by Jim, so I'm not going to redo that. Uh, but very clearly, uh, this is an example where you uh, grow uh, a mycoprotein from sustainable sugars uh, from grain, uh, and you make that into a food product. Uh, so as uh, environmental as it gets and as much use of all the uh, uh, nutrients of the streams uh, that are in there. So a uh, very highly efficient, impressive uh, process. And uh, uh, what we are doing at Wageningen Research is, uh, of course, we're trying to compare this microprotein to other types of benchmark products. So uh, uh, this could be to a plant uh, type protein, but also to the other type of microbial biomass type of products uh, to see uh, what are the, the, the advantages, uh, uh, what uh, uh, may be improved, what type of processes do we need to really get to the right characteristics. Uh, and so there's, I think, a few things that are relevant there. Of course, you have to be able to extrude it uh, for some applications. Uh, 
to uh, you want to look at the microprotein solubility uh, because that also uh, indicates uh, for what type of applications you can use it in the end. Uh, the nutri nutritional bioavailability is of course very relevant. Uh, so how does it compare to the uh, 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 very well described uh, dairy and soy type of applications? Uh, do you also get these high uh, DIAS uh, type of scores? Uh, and of course, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, can you also preserve it correctly and how to optimize that? Uh, and that, those are all unknowns at the moment for these types of applications. So let me just very shortly walk you through a few slides so that you get a very general idea on what we are doing here. Unfortunately, today we do not have time to go into the real details, uh, but just a very high over, overview on this. Um, so uh, uh, extrusion has been uh, tried uh, and both a uh, low moisture extrusion, uh, uh, which worked very well, uh, but also high moisture extrusion was successful uh, if this was used in combination uh, with uh, another uh, protein source uh, at the moment. And so uh, we think we are able to get uh, a quite uh, a nice uh, intermediate products out of this that can be used for uh, real product formation after the extrusion process. So that already shows that uh, 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 one can work quite nicely with the material and use it already for uh, various applications there. And this is currently explored in a lot more detail uh, by our department. Uh, we've also looked at the uh, 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 solubility and the water holding capacity. Uh, uh, and uh, on the right top, I'm not going to go into detail there also, but this is the general uh, experimental design that we used uh, over there. So you can just read that back uh, as I saw that the slides will be available at a later stage. Um, um, uh, what was very clear is that the solubility overall uh, is a little bit on the low side, uh, uh, but there was a clear pH dependency of the uh, solubility, at, at least at, at, at high temperatures, so at 90 degrees. Um, uh, 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 what we also see is that the water holding capacity uh, is rather high, and especially at high pH. So there's a clear uh, pH dependency of the water holding capacity where we see at pH 9 that the water holding capacity is much higher than at uh, a neutral pH, uh, and of course also much higher than at acidic uh, pH. Um, additionally, it seems to be uh, uh, slightly higher at room temperature than at 90 degrees. Uh, uh, overall. So that also indicates uh, that at a room temperature, uh, uh, well, the, the water holding capacity uh, is increased overall. If we look at the amino acid uh, profile and compare that to whey protein, huh, which has a very high amino acid score, of course, uh, very well known, then we see uh, that the uh, comparison shows that overall, and especially for the essential amino acids, these are rather comparable if you uh, look at the uh, amount of amino acids per total gram of protein. And so for the histidine, uh, threonine, uh, lysine, et cetera, the, these concentrations are overall roughly the same. And so that uh, uh, we are still looking at the final amino acid score and we'll look at a protein digestibility in the end. But so far, this looks quite acceptable uh, uh, for uh, such a product. And at least uh, uh, it looks definitely better than some of the other products that we have used and seen in the past. Then finally, um, uh, uh, of course, shelf life. And we, we didn't do the shelf life studies yet. So I'm just trying to give a very general example of how we approach this. So in the past, we have looked at, at sheet casings, uh, which is, of course, something different. But this is just an example uh, that you can also read up in detail in this publication that's indicated over here. And uh, uh, so what we generally do is we use uh, high throughput assays where we look at various parameters in a full matrix. So for this example, we looked at five soil concentrations, four temperatures, and four uh, pHs, and used that in a complete matrix to see what the effect was on uh, 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 microstability. And you can imagine that if you have five salt concentrations, four temperatures, and four pH conditions, that you, in a total matrix, you have 80 different conditions. And then we wanted to test a few microorganisms. 
uh, uh, during a longer time period in which we inactivated these microorganisms, uh, uh, which were inoculated on these type of sheep casings. Uh, and these were all pathogens. Uh, as you can see, uh, and in total, you can imagine we uh, have to do a lot of viability analysis. So I think uh, in, this, in this project in total, we did one over 20,000 uh, uh, colony forming unit uh, 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 assays. So really a lot of data there. And all that data, of course, I'm not going to show in these slides. But the summary of those data is, is that some organisms uh, 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 can be calculated then subsequently to be very sensitive to specific parameters, whilst for others they are not sensitive at all. And I think a nice example is that most of the pathogens are very sensitive to salt, as is always expected. So Staphylococcus aureus, Shiga coli, and Salmonella are very sensitive to salt. But uh, Listeria, surprisingly, is not so sensitive uh, to salt at all. And even more surprisingly, uh, 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 Listeria is very sensitive to the temperature, but in a way that was not expected at all in this example. So uh, at higher temperatures, uh, Listeria was inactivated faster uh, than at low temperatures. And uh, you have to realize that in an industrial setting, these type of sheep casings are always uh, kept at low temperature to uh, inactivate most of the organisms as fast as possible. And as you can see, for most of the organisms, this has no effect. And if it has an effect, it actually has a negative effect to keep this at low temperature. So this is how we approach this type of research using high throughput technologies. And so that brings me uh, in the view of time to, my, uh, to the future outlook. So there's a lot that we still have to study, obviously. Uh, we're just at the start of the, our initiative here. And so the uh, uh, range of things that we will do is, is study uh, further study the solubility, uh, color and texture and water holding capacity of the, uh, the new batch materials uh, and also look at batch to batch variation there to see um, how uh, uh, well uh, we can get that. Uh, we will also look uh, a little bit more at uh, the effects of mechanical pretreatment on the solubility and water holding capacity. Um, uh, and study the effect of specific additions and uh, uh, on the solubility and water holding capacity uh, uh, and a range of other uh, uh, applications. Um, uh, and finally, uh, I think uh, the, there will be a lot of focus on uh, looking at the, the uh, in vitro digestibility of the material and of course, finally, also on the impact of the gut microbiome to see what the effects are as compared to other uh, plant type of protein uh, products. And we think that especially the influence of anti nutritional factors uh, may be of high interest there. So, um, uh, well, this is, I think, uh, where I remain for today. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and I'll take any questions now. Thank you very much, Martijn, um, for a great presentation, a great overview about the project, as well as on the bigger picture. And this is always very important, right, because this is part of a evolution, and there's more, more side steps that you can take. But I think you've also great, done a great job in explaining what you really do in such a project, right? And what you research and what the contribution is for this project to really make it make it happen. So yeah. thanks a lot. Um, I don't see any questions now in the chat. Um, I want to maybe suggest, Martijn, if that's OK with you. Well, let's take one question because we are, I'm conscious of time, maybe at uh, 5.30 to close. Some questions can be taken later on the chat by you, right? But let's yeah, sure. uh, do the question of Marcel van der Vaart with the Cosum company. He's asking in a B2B setting, can the customers cope or want to work with wet ingredients or is there a preference for dry? So it's a food industry question about what they would prefer, uh, dry or wet. Oh, uh, I see an, an additional uh, question to that in relation yeah. to microstability. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, it's a great uh, uh, question. Huh? And uh, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm the right person to answer this question uh, 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 because I'm a little bit more on the research side. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in relation to microstability, I can say that for all the type of uh, uh, applications, so both for the wet and the uh, uh, dry uh, type of product, uh, uh, I think we'll look at the microstability uh, because uh, the, the, the amount of water that is in a product will definitely influence the microstability. I, I hope that is a little bit in the right direction. And Jim, maybe you can add a little bit to that, uh, to the first uh, part of that question. 
Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, Marcel. And we do acknowledge that the first question we get from a lot of customers initially is, can you make it dry? And clearly the answer with everything is, of course, we can make it dry. But um, I think the the world's food and the meat industry has handled wet. Most of the meats are 75 percent moisture and uh, the, the, the meat industry has handled that wet and the micro load of wet for its entire history. Um, and therefore, I think the, the fundamental efficiency of retaining in wet is embraced by a majority of customers. I, I'm aware that of some of the other people that are producing microprotein uh, have, have directed themselves more towards dry than enough has. We, mm -hmm. we still think that for meat and meat, meat alternative and fish alternative applications, the fundamental merits of the product in its in its wet format are easy to use. Um, we acknowledge that for some applications, um, uh, maybe in, in dairy applications, uh, dairy alternatives, then there's a higher desire for dry. And so we have, after five years of saying no, we've eventually dried some in the last couple of months. Um, okay, thank you so much. I think a very clear answer uh, to the question um, of, of concern. Uh, so thank you once again, Martijn, for being with us and also for Jim for answering. And I would like them to move to the last part of this webinar, which is a interactive uh, panel discussion. And if Alexander, Bastian, Peter and Sonia could switch on the camera, uh, we could talk about what your involvement is in this project and also to have some specific questions related to your own position. Um, uh, Shannon? Um, if yeah, great. If you could switch off the uh, presentation, that's super. So sure. there's four experts here. There's Alexander Lam with IFF, Sonia with uh, LCE, Peter Verstraat with Moza Meat, and Bastien with uh, Lactives. Could I all ask you um, for a very short answer to the first question? Actually, what from your own position or your organization is your interest in microprotein? If if I could start maybe with maybe Alexander and 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 then move on. Sure, thanks, Jana. So basically, basically, uh, I think Jim did all the introduction about enough and and the, mm -hmm. the sustainable part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with IFF, we have been early adopters already in Planitude, so we have been early on that project, especially on finding new proteins and also being an early adopter in the market with the sustainable part. So I think the sustainability drive here is really unique um, and also the, the results out of the out of the trial scale. So um, the involvement of the product um, has been really enormous. So that's something um, why we as an IFF are looking into that because we are we also moving in terms of our company into the plant-based arena um, four or five years ago, and that changes and that will also move forward in terms of taste and texture and that comparison to, to leverage that to our consumers. Fantastic, thank you so much. Could I move to Sonia? Maybe also Sonia mentioned very shortly what your organization is doing, um, because I forgot to ask Alexander, but I assume most people know EIFF. Sorry, Alexander. Sonia. Um, no problem at all. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, we are a partner of the Plenitude project, and uh, we oversee the SCA, Life Cycle Assessment Analysis, and also the uh, economic and social uh, and social assessment mm -hmm. uh, related to the microprotein production. Uh, we will uh, uh, also focus our analysis on uh, the, the new plant, uh, the enough uh, enough food uh, located in Pass Van Ghent, as uh, uh, Jim uh, explained before, and also the relative use of the microprotein as uh, innovative uh, ingredients in meat alternative food and not only also plastic, mm -hmm. bioplastic and so on. Uh, we will use for the environmental part the life cycle assessment that is a methodology, widespread methodology, and uh, it is uh, considered one of the, the best frameworks to, to evaluate uh, among those that are currently available for assessing the, the potential uh, environmental impact. 
and uh, it uh, give us the, the the complete overview of the all the the, the production from from the raw materials or the microprotein to the final uh, product. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, uh, Sonia. Uh, could I move to uh, to Peter uh, from Moja Meat? Sure. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's a number of interests from our side. Um, what we do is grow mammalian cells, essentially, and after that, mammalian tissues. And, and just like animals, our cells need to eat. And an essential part of their food is uh, is pre-digested protein, so amino acids and smaller peptides. And that protein uh, it needs to be well, massively available in the future. If this technology kicks in in the next decades, it needs to be cheap, mm -hmm. it needs to have a certain nutritional quality, it needs to be made in a sustainable way. And, and you know, microprotein is the potential to tick all those boxes, uh, in particular through the production concept that is plenitude. Uh, so that's 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 a clear interest. And then another one would be if you make larger pieces of tissue through tissue engineering, you need a so-called scaffolding, so a material that the cells adhere to in the early stages of forming larger structures. Um, and again, ideally the scaffold is digestible, food grade, what have you, and microprotein might might be a part of such a scaffold. We're going to explore that a bit later in the in the, in the project as well. Um, and and finally. I would mention so-called hybrid products. So, which in this case would mean a mix of microprotein on one hand and, and cultured mammalian tissues like, like muscle or maybe even more so fat uh, on the other hand to get sort of the best of both worlds, either for texture or, or taste or price mm -hmm. or, or all of the above. So there's a number of interesting fields. Where, yeah, where fantastic. Three, three very concrete uh, reasons to be here. Thank you so much, um, 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 Bastien, um, mm -hmm. Avu. Yeah, thank you, Gail. Uh, hello to everyone. So I'm Bastien from Lactips. So Lactips, we are a French SME, and our like applications and job is quite different from mm -hmm. the other partners of Plenitude Project that have been talking till now. Uh, our specialty is to sell and produce uh, bioplastic pellets. Uh, bioplastic pellets made out of protein, but for the moment only milk protein and dairy proteins. So mainly focusing on casein and dairy alternatives. Uh, so our interest is clear uh, for this subject is to find new feedstocks of proteins, which are more sustainable, uh, which can give us new, let's say, properties, new market and new applications. Uh, so yeah, the idea is to work with European based products uh, to keep our sourcing in Europe, to work with new sources of protein and this new type of protein is a real challenge for us uh, and we believe that we could uh, approach new markets and new applications with the, these mm -hmm. new properties. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, a very innovative uh, field for you, I, I can hear that. Yeah. Um, we've got one question for each of the panel members related to their own position. Uh, I would like to start with Peter. From the three things that you just mentioned, right, in terms of your interest, huh? uh, the question would be, yeah, what are the specific in scientific fields that need to be developed to make this microprotein take off from from your position. Again, it's a, it's a number of of, uh, mm -hmm. of initiatives that we have to take off. Um, if you if you if you look at a microprotein as a feed source for or a food source or whatever you call it for cells, um, you would you would have to develop and 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 understand basically the hydrolysis process so the process to to, to ferment um, the microprotein into that let's call it surf side in other words you need to access the nutritional potential that is that is there which by the way is not restricted just to protein um, also other nutrients like minerals and vitamins in the in the uh, abundant material um, might be very interesting but Developing such a process to to turn uh, the, the the harvested protein into something that our cells actually eat would be a, would be a big one, and mm -hmm. a very and a very interesting one. Then more generically, there's understanding the biology, the metabolism of our cells. That's something we need to do for just about every you know application within our field. Um, the, the metabolism we use in every stage of the process. Uh, we need to understand it with great depth, and we need to transfer those insights to uh, to feeding conditions in larger bioreactors in order to make the process run and make it effective and, and efficient uh, as, as we can. 
um, and the growth media, so the composition uh, of it or replenishing it or removing it at certain stages is an important factor in this field of research. So that's, that's funny enough, it's not hardcore, hardcore deep diving science, but it's a lot of work and it's, it has a lot to do with generating loads and loads and loads of data, uh, as was mentioned in the Wageningen uh, uh, presentation earlier, and, and making sense of that. And on the scaffolding side, um, it's it's about combining biology, so the interaction between cells and biomaterials on one hand, and on the other hand, look at processes like like extrusion to physically make structures at large scale, uh, again, on which or in which uh, cells grow and differentiate into tissues. This is a relatively young field of research, but it's it's very interesting going forward as, as well. Mm -hmm. Those would be the most interesting ones, just at yeah. the top of my head. No, well, as always, a very elaborate and thoughtful answer, Peter. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, there's a lot of this, um, things to do, as you mentioned, uh, acquiring data. Um, I would like to uh, to move from the data part to the people part and ask uh, Alexander the question. You're a global uh, ingredient leader, right? And also solution providers by sometimes being involved for maybe up to 80, 90 percent of all the ingredients in a meat free product. Uh, the question is actually related to this project, uh, but also to the bigger space. You know, what is for you and where is the collaborative space from your viewpoint? Well, basically, you already mentioned that um, it's it's really it's really as Peter mentioned as well. It's really a broad spectrum, and we in IFF we we can look into the flavor part, the taste part of that. So, what is mm -hmm. really the the off notes? Do we need to really mask something? Do we need to mm -hmm. um, improve something in terms of savory mouthfeel? Um, we could we could look into the taste and texture part. So, bringing it into differentiating. Um, the ingredients, so taking all the benefits of the microprotein, the light, the fibrousness, the juiciness of the product, mixing it with some other proteins to bring it more density or bring it into a certain um, field of an application. So that's really a broad application area where we can build on. And especially in IFF, we're really looking into designing these type of concepts together with our customers. So designing and taking the parts and uh, the mm -hmm. differentiating parts of, of the abunda of the protein here is really the key in terms of bringing that into differentiating applications into the market. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, it's a very interesting uh, word that you use, designing collaboration, right? Designing product, designing formulation. We are here in the designing phase. Right? And if you are in yeah. the designing phase, you can build together. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and there's no limit in terms of the ingredients or in terms of the technologies. Right? You really can think of looking into LME or HME production as well. So building up recipes um, with different ingredients, even adding hydrocolates or colors, mm -hmm. um, shelf life improvers in the whole bunch. So then um, producing your whole uh, new protein with that. So it's mm -hmm. it's really it's a new it's a new spectrum here. It's a new uh, atmosphere where we're moving, and we can really pick like a like in a good toolbox. We can pick mm -hmm. uh, the nice bits and pieces we want to have and add that into into the recipe for the customer. Yeah, and also for other uh, maybe areas where you might not be working in like uh, fats and oils, right? It was also mentioned by Martijn, indirectly also by Peter. So a lot of opportunities to to collaborate. Um, moving to Bastian, um, I think the, uh, the, the question I wanted to ask you in terms of the opportunities for this ingredient for you, from your point, from where you are now, maybe not having done all the work, but what does your gut feel tells you what, what could happen in the coming years with microprotein for bioplastic usage? Uh -huh. uh, I think that uh, if we think globally to the, let's say, bioplastics market, uh, it's a huge market that's growing very fast. Uh, there is a huge demand and there is also regulations that are coming on fossil based plastics or single use plastics that are already uh, marching. Uh, so this pushes the market to bioplastic industry. Uh, so bioplastic is not only plastics from like proteins. There are also other stuff that can be developed. But for the protein part, uh, mm -hmm. they have a lot of advantages on these applications because they look like like classical polymers. They have chains, long chains that can like cross link, 
create a network and to have some plastic effect. Uh, but they are bio-based, biodegradable, and there is a huge trend also on this kind of new plastic and new packaging is the vegan uh, plastic, uh, where these microprotein could be a huge, uh, a huge, have a huge impact. Uh, so I think there is a place for this kind of product. Um, maybe not to tomorrow, but yeah, in the coming years it will be bigger and bigger. Uh, mm -hmm. If you think about all these, yeah, regulation opportunities, and also if you if we take the like the parallel with the starch that has been like in the five mm -hmm. or six past years very developed for these kind of applications, uh, I believe really that like proteins and in this kind of microprotein can be like a good uh, a good way to develop new compounds and new properties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're at the beginning of an evolution. Um, yeah, for sure. And the word uh, vegan plastic is a new one for me. I've never <laughs> heard about that. That's very interesting. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, but it's been around for some time already. I understand. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe it will also dissolve nicely in huh, in our oceans when we start using it. Yeah, for sure. That would be better. Even if the solution is not okay, but biodegradation would be like enough. Essential. That's a joke. Yeah. 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 No, but I think uh, it's all about finding niches huh, that yeah. are, are profitable and where you have a, a unique uh, USPs. So uh, fantastic that you do all this work in this type of application. Um, okay. my, my question, I think, to well, the nice maybe closing question from my side in view of this panel to Sonia would be, uh, you have all been speaking about kind of uh, a longer life, huh, about sustainability and in, in many different ways. And Sonia, about your um, work on the life cycle analysis, right? That you're gonna do, you're gonna come up with data. Could you make a little bridge to the bigger picture from, from where you're coming from with LCEs? Is um, what, what do you th think the coming years is essential for all the industries, right? To tick the boxes either for the sustainable development goals or for consumers or for climate or for so what is the role of the data for microprotein that you will help food manufacturers or maybe bioplastic eh, organizations to to tick a box uh, of a need of uh, of maybe the consumer or from an environmental reason yes i think that the the, the life cycle uh, assessment uh, methodology can give us uh, a, a complete overview on the environmental impacts uh, mm -hmm. on the production of the microprotein from the raw material uh, production to the use phase and to the end of life. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, it would be very interesting uh, from uh, all the uh, to assess uh, with primary data as we will uh, uh, as we will do. Mm -hmm. Uh, go through the the production and understand uh, the, the the environmental uh, the, the overall environmental mm. impact. Then the mm. it will be very important to to understand uh, the uh, weakest point. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe if uh, the uh, we can uh, uh, we can lower, for example, the uh, the impact of the microprotein production or uh, the uh, final product. Uh, in which the microprotein will, uh, will be used. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, it, it is the, the, the one of the, the, the most important things uh, for which the life cycle assessment will be used mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to understand and investigate the biggest contributors to the overall uh, impact mm -hmm. and then to uh, understand which are the key points in which it, it works to be and what to intervene and to understand how to, to, to lower the, the impact. Uh, we, we know that the microprotein are made from uh, uh, from cereals, so the production of plant food, uh, with, uh, along with uh, fruit, vegetable, and so on, uh, produce a lower greenhouse gases emission than the animal product. So to understand how to uh, intervene and lower uh, this kind of impact could be very important, uh, uh, along with the um, uh, the comparison with the, the, the animal food that uh, have a, a very high impact. Thank you very much, Sonia. To anybody who's got a question, we will continue for another four minutes. Please ask the question here. I wanted to ask you all a question in relation to maybe what you just said, Sonia, right? Uh, you hear about LCA, 
LCE, LCA, and you also hear about sustainability. But sometimes when we speak to um, uh, the industry, they say, well, we, we convert this into a, a carbon claim. So on the consumer, uh, on the consumer pack, uh, if we, we put something about, you know, the savings there or how you have impact and, and it's a combination of all many different things, right? It's energy uh, and, and other things as well. Do you see an evolution there in how um, uh, organizations are using then the data to communicate to consumers? And I'd like to ask Peter and Alexander and Bastian later on to answer as well. What, what's your what's your idea, Sonia? Uh, oh, oh yes, I think that um, uh, communicating uh, to to the customers uh, through mm -hmm. the the packaging it's important. Uh, mm -hmm. They uh, you, uh, through some cool codes and so on. Uh, sometimes they communicate this kind of uh, uh, carbon emission, but they also uh, um, they can, the, the industry can also um, teach. To, to all the to all its customers how it's uh, important to lower the impact mm -hmm. and how they can uh, they have lowered their impact uh, I don't know uh, through mm -hmm. uh, some kind of uh, inter in interventions that they made uh, in their mm -hmm. uh, in their production process so uh, I think that it's okay. very useful and it will be very important also in the future mm -hmm. and, and, and Alexander uh, in relation to yeah, enough pro, huh? as a protein source. Is there one well, one item that comes up with your mind in terms of consumer communication, which is important? I think I think for sure the sustainability part is a is a driver in the market. But uh, nevertheless, um, taste and texture is still uh, mm -hmm. still yeah. at the consumer level really important. So it needs to be it needs to be. Um, it needs to be succulent. It needs to be tasty, and that's that's also a part which uh, the Abunda protein is delivering into the product. It does give fibrousness. It does give the juicy bite, and and that's also something which uh, needs to stand out here. Mm -hmm. Peter, could I could I pick your brains on this? Well, you know, there there's been some alignment going on when it comes to nutritional data related to health uh, uh, on back. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, uh, but you know it's 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 there's there, and there are various systems, some driven by retail, some by governments, but there is some alignment there, and I think you see similar things happening indeed in in sustainability scores, uh, simply because there's a price tag attached to that, and that's going to mm -hmm. become more more clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I I do see that happen. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and, and your ideas probably also I think which you mentioned just to reconfirm that. Yeah, this protein is quite well placed, right? To tick all those boxes for. Uh... Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, you would have to agree on a system to validate that, and what have you. I mean, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of paperwork attached to mm -hmm. to make it actually turning it into something that's that's that works in the market. But, so uh, but yes, I I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bastien, yeah. what do you see in terms of this? Yeah, uh, plant-based material in bioplastics and. Yeah. Sustainability. Yeah, we uh, when we talk about sustainability in in like our segment of applications, we think about circularity, and we think about possible recyclability of this product, mm -hmm. uh, not only like biodegradation, so the end of the product, but mainly reuse it in a way to recycle it. So maybe in addition with paper to give it like properties or so there are main there are lots of ways to make it mm -hmm. make sustainable products with this kind of of microproteins but uh for us it's like the end of life and the and the source and the, in the middle it's our process and it's the most sustainable as possible but as sonia said it's like we need to work on how to make it even more sustainable yeah Fantastic. I think uh, that's a nice closing and a positive outlook for where we are now and where we're going to go. Uh, we will do another webinar um, end of this year together with uh, the, the team or a little bit early, maybe next year. We still have to plan that so you can stay tuned in what's going on in these developments. Um, I would like to ask everybody in the audience for two things, for a big applause for all the speakers, including the panel members. We're very grateful for that and also for my team, uh, Shannon and Barb, who have pulled this off as their first webinar, uh, managing it from Canada. Uh, uh, you have bridged already the ocean to Europe with having uh, this, this project. So very well done. Thank you so much for everything.